So our topic today uh, is going to be the biblical case for Petrine primacy. So let's get into it. Uh, number one, he is listed as number one in every list of the apostles. And by the way, Judas is always listed last. Yeah. So not not to not to say that the further they go down, they're like somehow worse and worse. But the fact that Judas is always mentioned last indicates is, that he's. Not yeah. the leader. And they also say, <laughs> who betrayed him? Mm -hmm. There's huge spoiler alerts in all four Gospels. You know who's going to betray him from like chapter 2 or 3. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Matthew chapter 4 is the first time when we see a list of the apostles. This is when Jesus is going out, picking his disciples, who he's going to have. And the first thing in Matthew's Gospel says is he saw Andrew and Peter, uh, sorry, Peter and Andrew out in their boat fishing listing Peter first, then it goes on James and John, uh, Philip Bartholomew, and he, he picks out the other ones as well. But Peter is the one who's named first. So uh, I think that's going to be interesting as we get into some more examples. Matthew chapter 10 verse 2 lists the names of all the apostles. First thing it says is, and it even uses the word, first Simon, who was called Peter, then Andrew, his brother, and so forth, all the way down to the And even the first time Judas. that it mentions that Andrew went and got Peter to bring him to Jesus, it mentions Andrew, but it mentions him like after Peter, even though okay. it's mentioning him finding Peter. It says, Andrew, now Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother? Yeah, that's in John's gospel, it introduces Andrew before it introduces Simon Peter, which is really interesting, especially in light of this first point we're making. But how does it introduce Andrew? John chapter 1, verse 40. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, we haven't met Simon Peter yet in John's gospel, but somehow he knew his audience would know, oh, that Simon Peter, we know who that is, right. so Andrew's the, his brother. John the Beloved, or the scribe that maybe took down his preaching, the sacred author that is either John himself or someone who's relating his preaching uh, that he's dictating to. Mm -hmm. There is a tradition in the early church that John dictated his gospel to a scribe. Mm -hmm. um, but you you see there that he he's like, well, my audience who's reading this throughout throughout the church, scattered mm -hmm. in the dispersion of the church, they may not know who Andrew is, but they'll definitely know who Simon Peter is. Peter's the reference point to get who all the other apostles are. Right. And we don't know a lot about all the other apostles. You know, for example, the only thing we know about the other Simon among the apostles is that he was a zealot. Because he's called Simon the Zealot. Right. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why Jesus made one of his apostles a zealot, because he was trying to teach him that there's also a way of love, mm -hmm. that you do not have to take up arms necessarily every time. So this first point about Peter being named first, I, I bring it up because it happens a lot. It's not like one or two times in the Bible. It's in Matthew 4.18, Matthew 10.2, Mark 1.16, Mark 1.36, Mark 3.16, Mark 13.3, Luke 6.14, and Acts 1.13. These are all places where the apostles are listed. And in every single time, Peter's first. So there's something about that that says, you know, the other apostles, are they vary in their order. Uh, Philip might come before Bartholomew or uh, Andrew after John. But Peter's always first, and there's a reason for that in Scripture, and we're going to look into that, but it's one piece of evidence that there's something special about well, Peter. It's like, you know, Dan, it's like with, with my family, when people people say, uh, well, how many kids are, in, how many siblings are in your family? I say Amanda, Andrea, et cetera, et cetera. I always start off with my oldest sister because she's the first sibling. Mm -hmm. In this sense, Peter's always listed first because he was the first brother. Yeah, he was the first, and it wasn't because he was the first one to know Jesus. Andrew's the one who introduced uh, F Peter to Jesus, but Peter was important for some other reason that made him the one to head out all these lists. Uh, okay, so number two, um, and this one's very similar, it doesn't prove by itself, but Peter is named more times than all of the other apostles combined. So that's uh, 155 times versus 130 for uh, that's all the other apostles combined like, and to think of it that's including paul mm -hmm. and yeah, the, yeah. the bulk of the new testament was written by paul and mm -hmm. even his name is mentioned far fewer times yeah well he, he, his name is listed at the beginning of each of his epistles uh, so that's like 13 times right there and, and you, you add them all up though you add up uh andrew P Cep or, sorry andrew james john Philip, Bartholomew, uh, Paul, and the others, and you say all, all of these people who are very important, the other Simon, the, the good Judas, the bad Judas, these are all very important people in the Bible story, uh, they don't even come close to the level of importance that's attached to Peter with his name appearing, or one of his three names, 
Peter, Cephas, or Simon, all appearing together 155 combined times. So there's something about I mean, Peter. The New Testament is a book. Mm-hmm. It's or a collection of books, but the Bible, the New Testament is a document. It's like it's like reading a, a collective work, a book. Mm-hmm. It's it's like it's like when you read the Harry the Harry Potter novels, and Harry Potter's name obviously comes way first, so that would be the number of times Jesus' name would be mentioned in, mm-hmm. as as an analogy. But then, like it's like Ron Weasley's like right behind him for some reason. Sure, Ron and Hermione are right up there. And uh, it's it's kind of a similar role. Peter is Ron to Harry Potter's Peter or J- or Jesus. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a really good analogy in an analogous way. Yeah. All right. So um, the another reason why we talk about this, uh, I want to bring up Mark one thirty six because this is an indicator of how Peter's status was among the other apostles. Mark one thirty six says uh, Simon and his companions went out to look for him, speaking of Jesus here. His companions here are all the other apostles. Simon, the other apostles are the companions of Peter. Peter is clearly the one Peter went out to look for him. Oh, by by, by the way, the others were there too. Yeah, the other apostles (laughs) were. So they're not of equal importance. There's fewer, there's more references to Peter and there's more importance attached to Peter in the Bible than all the others. And we'll get to that when we get to Paul's letters as well, because he also does this. Okay, so uh, we're going to get into some more meaty stuff now uh, after we've gone through the names and the numbers and the, and the times that people are listed. Uh, we're going to get into some of the meat now, some of the passages that doctrinally teach us what Peter's role is. So what's an example of one of those? Well, right off the bat, uh, the classic Peter passage, uh, Matthew chapter 16. So I'm going to flip open here. We're going to take a look at what Matthew chapter 16 says about Peter. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, this is Matthew 16, verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, verses 17 through 18. What do you think, Brad? Well, first of all, we have to see that the keys, again, denote the house of David and him being sort of the grand vizier or the prime minister role. Mm-hmm. And which also in Matthew 18, we'll see that, you know, the rest of the apostles have the authority to bind and loose as well. But we have to see that the person with the keys is the one that adjudicates disputes sure. between, because if all the other brothers can't agree on whether they should bind and lose something. There has to be someone to adjudicate disputes on faith and morals. Sure. Uh, you can't have collegiality without the head of a college. I would say there's four main things in this passage that indicate Peter's headship. One of them is his name. This is where Jesus gives Peter the new name, Simon, I call you Peter. Uh, that's his new name. It means rock. As a foundation word. In the it's- Northern Aramaic that Jesus spoke, it would have been uh, kepha. Yeah, kepha here is the Aramaic word for rock. In fact, that appears in John one forty two, where they put it and turn it into Greek literally as you know Cephas. That's what Jesus names him. I name you rock. That's a foundation word, and that indicates Peter's headship uh, just right there in his name. Second, and when you give someone a new name in Scripture, you give them a mission. This is like when Moses was named Moses, and his mother drew him out of the water. You know, that happens in scripture. People give a name and then they give the reason for the name. Uh, Adam called his wife Eve because she was taken out of man. Out of man and it's like Ev and Eva right there in the Greek. Mm-hmm. Jesus was named Jesus, the angel says in Matthew chapter 1, because he shall save his people from their sins. Saving being Yesha and Jesus' name is Yeshua. So the name is related to the function here. The, the name gives... Uh, there's a reason for it. And so when Jesus gives Peter his new name, I call you Peter because on this rock I shall build my church. That's his mission. That's the reason for the name. It follows that biblical pattern. And we should we should make a, a mention here that when we talk about headship, we mean visible head of the church on earth. Sure. We, we don't mean absolute supreme universal throughout the cosmos. We're not trying to have Peter usurp the headship of Jesus. Sure. But yeah. Jesus being being the king of kings can set up a prime minister, a royal steward role. He can role. do what he wants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he can set up other shepherds, and he did. He set up the apostles as other shepherds to shep- help shepherd his flock. 
Yeah. But, um, but, um, and he gave some of them special roles, including one of them had uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So here's a third thing that's in this passage. The keys of the kingdom of heaven, they're a symbol for authority. Uh, like if I give you the keys to my house, I'm going on vacation here, here are the keys to my house. I'm giving you charge of my house, and if something if something happens here, you're responsible for making sure it's safe. It's, it's another way of, you, of saying, you know, what's mine is yours. Yeah, that, that, that too. So he gives him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He gives him the authority of the kingdom of heaven behind his decisions. That's one huge reason why we think that makes Peter uh, a, a leader, the leader of the apostles. And all, then finally, the fourth reason, um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is God backing Peter's decisions. Yeah, well, we should we should also realize that Binding and loosing would have been very familiar rabbinic theology for first century Jews. And they would have seen the authority behind the, the terms binding and loosing. Yeah, we can see that as just one example uh, in Isaiah chapter 22, where, uh, it, where Shebna is set up as the prime minister of the house of Israel. Uh, Luke chapter, or not Luke, Isaiah chapter 22, the kingdom of David is here, and he gives uh, Shebna the authority to... Uh, he gives him authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. This is Isaiah twenty two twenty one. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall open. I will fasten him like a peg in a sure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. This is one of the passages that Jesus is evoking with his binding and loosing language where it is clearly, this is the prime minister of the kingdom. This is the guy who has authority and has successors to take up that key after it's passed this down. This was one apologetic that the counter-reformation theologians would use when debating Lutherans and Calvinists in the 16th century. Jesus was because very many, Jewish, and because, he loved to cite the Old Testament. Right, because many people did not know about Isaiah 22. So there's lots of reasons within Matthew 16 of that passage there from verses 17 to 18, why uh, Peter is indicated here as uh, head of the church that Jesus announces he's going to build. Um, moving on from there, there's many other passages to get into as well. Uh, one of them that I like to go into, and this one's uh, less common uh, among apologetics literature, is Luke chapter 12. So let me flip open here to Luke chapter 12. Uh, we'll get into this. This is less focused on, but Luke chapter 12, verses 39 to 41. Jesus says, But know this, that if the householder had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have been awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? What do you think of that, Brad? I mean, Peter's asking what it means, and Jesus is like, You're supposed wink, to know wink, this. nod, nod. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to know this. Uh, who am I supposed to set over my household? It's pretty explicit here. The steward, the steward who I'm supposed to set over my household to give their portion of food at the proper time. This is uh, a very analogous role to the role of the Pope. He is the chief steward, and he's supposed to give us our spiritual food, the Word of God, mm -hmm. at the you know at, every day. I also I also want to um, make a point real quick. Just a side note: a lot of times Protestants will use the term head pastor, mm -hmm. and they have no but, problem. But we can't have one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They 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 you're, they they're they, usurping they, the role of Jesus, who's supposed to be our chief. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, but you're doing that too. Well, it's okay when we do it. <laughs> you know? it's, 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 it's almost like when they say, well, why do you call your priest father? And then they go around calling, well, this guy's my spiritual father. And, yeah, you yeah. know, they, it's like if you put... You're not supposed to have titles, right, Reverend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> yeah, I, they, they, they do this. Uh, sometimes you'll find people who uh, make these kinds of claims and they, they haven't researched and even thought about... Those Catholics don't know their Bible, do they, Bishop Miller? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we're not supposed to have titles. So, so that that because Jesus says that you shouldn't be called a father, doctor, teacher, or or you know, Lord. But 
he, but they, they say, but, but they call their Sunday school teachers Bible teachers. They call them teachers. They have their doctors who they go to. They they have their uh, and they and they give them titles. They call their dad father, even though it says you're not supposed to call anyone father on earth. But it, you know it's okay when we do it. <laughs> yeah, just you Catholics. Uh, so there's Luke chapter 12 where Peter or Jesus is explicit that there's going to be a chief steward uh, set over his household and that Peter's supposed to be it. I think that's really good evidence. That's not the only thing Luke has to offer for us, though. Uh, Luke chapter 22 is one of the most explicit passages about Peter's role, where Jesus is talking to the apostles in Luke 22, 31. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, <clears throat> Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you yourself, that your own faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. This is really critical here. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you all, plural here. He's talking to all the apostles, that he may sift you all like wheat. The Bible I'm looking at, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Editions, got the little you know, footnotes here where it says that you know, the Greek word for, for you here is plural. But then in verse 32... I have prayed for you yourself, it goes to singular again, I have prayed for you yourself, that when you yourself have turned again, strengthen your brethren. The, the, all the apostles are in danger. Satan demanded to have them all, that he may sift them all. But Jesus prays for Peter, that his faith may not fail. And this reminds me of like, if, uh, when, the, when the plant is, going, is in danger of, uh, of dying, you water the root. When the tribe is in danger of being attacked, you tell the chief. You go to the person who's in charge, to and then he can help all the rest. Peter's role here is to strengthen his brethren when they're all in danger, and it's it's very explicit. One, that some translations, he has a role there. one translations say this is the passage where Jesus is prophesying his denials, mm -hmm. and he's in some translations it'll say once you are converted, confirm your brethren. Mm -hmm. So Jesus yeah. foretells that he he will fall into some sin, but that he will convert, mm -hmm. and he will he will be be the one to confirm the brethren. And confir confirming someone is a very su supporting. Uh, it's a very what's the word foundational role. It's the upholding role, the st supporting role, the strengthening role, the the one that says you know you're like the you're like the pillar that the others are resting upon. You're the mm -hmm. you're the firm support for them all. So uh, that Peter's role there is very foundational, according to the words of Jesus, when he when he gives them this mission of all you are all in danger. You're the one who has to uh, you know fix things. Yeah, and I have prayed for you that your faith mm -hmm. will not fail. So th yeah, that it's super important right there. Uh, so we've been through Matthew, we've been through Luke. Uh, let's also check out what the Gospel of John has to say about Peter's role. John chapter twenty one. Uh, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And then he does it again a third time. What, what do you think about this passage, Brad? Well, in the Greek... The word tend is also another, it's a, it's a, it's in the Greek root, it, 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 it is, it denotes shepherding, ruling, mm -hmm. overseeing. And actually the word bishop that you encounter later on in the New Testament is episkopos or episkopoi, which mm -hmm. means to be an overseer. And, and if we notice... It's the same you, word that Jesus that it calls Jesus in the book of Revelation. He shall rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That word, he will rule all the nations, is the same word that's used here when it says Peter's going to tend, rule, the sheep. The Greek word's the same. Yeah. And also, it's the exact same word when he says... Um, the, this shepherding role is the same one that Jesus prophesied in John chapter 10. It when is. He, when he said, there will be one flock and one shepherd. Yeah, and, and there is a role for Peter there to be the pe person in, the, in charge of this flock. I think it's really interesting here. The, who, who's in the flock of Christ? There's the sheep and there's the lambs. There's the sheep who are the older people in the, in the flock of Christ, people who've been Christians for a while. And there's the lambs who are the younger people, the new Christians, the, the converts. And, the, and Peter's given charge of feeding the sheep, the, yeah. the older ones in Christ right. who've been a Christian for a long time, and tending the lambs, the, the ones who are newer in and Christ. G and Jesus said, uh, who, whose sheep? His sheep. Yeah. Whose lambs? His lambs. That includes everybody. It is. Yeah. The, the lambs and the sheep, there's no one else in the flock. 
That's it. That's it. <laughs> right. Uh, so if you're in the flock of Christ, then you have someone who's supposed to be in charge of you, who's supposed to feed you and tend you and rule in this in this sheepfold. Jesus tells us this in his gospel when he's teaching about how his flock, how his church is going to be governed. He gives it a shepherd. And actually, the the word pastor mm-hmm. comes from a German word that means shepherd. It does, yeah. In, in even the English word, you so, sometimes talk about. So when Protestants are calling, the, when Protestants the are calling their their ministers, when they say the head pastor, they're saying the head shepherd. Yeah, the, and that's all. That's what, again. that's what we're saying about the Pope. Hey, this clip was taken from the full show, which you can listen to at historyandapologetics.com or at our YouTube channel, History and Apologetics.